be reading in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 37. Acts, chapter 2, verse 37. Acts, chapter 2, verse 37. Let's stand together for the reading of the word. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. I want to preach this morning on God's word to sinners. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the privilege that we have to know the Lord and to have the Bible. I thank you for the word that you have spoken to us through the gospel message. We thank you for this salvation. Pray that you'd bless and anoint me this morning, that I'd be able to deliver the message that I feel that you've laid upon my heart. I pray that it would do good to this congregation. May your name be honored through it. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Before I get started in my message, we will be having regular service this evening at 6.30, prayer at 6 o'clock, regular service at 6.30 this evening. I want to preach to you on God's word to sinners. For 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, the world didn't hear anything from the followers of Christ. For 40 days, they were meeting with Jesus, the risen Savior, and he was instructing them concerning the kingdom of God. And they had been instructed by him to tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. They needed that power for the global mission that the Lord had given to them. They were to be witnesses unto him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. They had been given instructions to make disciples of all nations, Specifically, they were told to preach repentance and remission of sins throughout the world, beginning at Jerusalem. So after tearing in Jerusalem for ten days after the ascension of Christ, on the 50th day, the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The New Testament church was birthed in a blaze of glory. Tongues of fire set upon their heads. There was the sound of a rushing mighty wind that filled all of that place. There were crowds that soon arrived at this place, attracted to this place by the miracles that were going on there. And they heard these uneducated Galileans speak to them in the different languages present the wonderful works of God. With wonder and amazement, these sinners hearing these things ask a question, What meaneth this? This question that they ask, What meaneth this? provoked a response from Peter and the other apostles. Peter began to speak under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And in his message, he demonstrated that the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, which they were witnessing, had been prophesied in the Old Testament by the Old Testament prophet Joel. He also demonstrated that the outpouring of the Holy Ghost was a confirmation of the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. He said in Acts 2 and 33, 
therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he, that is Jesus, has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. So the very one that they thought was dead, they had crucified him. Peter says he's alive. And this is the result of his activity. He has poured out the Holy Ghost upon us. He furthermore declared that this one that you crucified, God raised him from the dead and made him both Lord and Christ. These people hearing this message, preached under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, came under crushing condemnation. They were like the brothers of Joseph, who when they come down to Egypt, they had sold their brother into slavery, and no doubt thought he was dead. And all of a sudden, this powerful man, second in command in Egypt, says, I am Joseph, whom ye sold into slavery. Can you imagine how they felt in the presence of this man with such power? And they had been the ones that sold him into slavery. And now then, these people who had crucified the Lord of glory are in the presence of that very one that they crucified upon the cross. He's alive and well. And what they are witnessing is the result of his activity. He has poured out the Holy Ghost just as he promised. So this audience, under crushing condemnation, ask another question. What shall we do? And Peter's answer to this question is critical, not only to his audience on that day, but to succeeding generations. Peter would set a pattern for the church of the ages. When Peter, when Peter answered, his first word was God's word to sinners in every age. One word, repent. This was God's message to sinners. Repent. Peter had heard that message from John the Baptist. John the Baptist preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Peter had heard this message from Jesus, who preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He had heard Jesus say, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And Jesus is the one that instructed Peter, and all the apostles, that repentance and remission of sins must be preached in Jerusalem and throughout the whole world. I have three simple points to my message. First of all, the necessity of repentance. Secondly, the fruit of repentance. And thirdly, the privilege of repentance. I want to talk to you about the necessity of repentance. If men do not repent according to the scriptures, they perish. Repentance in the Hebrew is shed. And it means to change from the wrong path to the right path. In the Greek language, repentance is metanoia. And it means a change of mind. There was a devotional classic written in about 140 A.D. called The Shepherd. And in this classic writing, the author says, Repentance is great understanding. Minds are breaking forth <clears throat> into the mind, mind excuse me, of our true condition before God. It clears up the self-distortions of who we are and makes us aware of the fact that we have sinned against God, that our sin is serious against God, and something must be done about our sin. Repentance is great understanding. It's a change of direction in life that's produced by a correct understanding of our sinful condition 
and the peril of our position outside of Jesus Christ. In repentance, we turn from sin unto Christ, from the disease to the cure, from facing hell to facing heaven. We make a U-turn in life. This is what repentance is. In my text, repentance resulted from the preaching that was both anointed and pointed. It wasn't the miracles of Pentecost that produced conviction of sin. It was the message of Pentecost that produced conviction of sin. They beheld the miracles. They saw the miracles of Pentecost and wanted to know what does this mean. But when they heard the anointed, pointed message of Pentecost, they wanted to know, what shall we do? Conviction was produced by this pointed and anointed message preached to them by Peter. Peter charged them with slaying Jesus with wicked hands. I'm telling you, this was a different man than that man a few days ago who denied Jesus three times in the courtyard during the trial of Jesus. This man has been filled with the Holy Ghost, full of the boldness given to him by the Holy Ghost. And these same people that he once feared, he charged them with crucifying the Lord of glory. He is made fearless by the knowledge that these people will perish unless they understand the immensity of their sin and repent, and that burden upon his heart for those souls, and the love for Jesus, and the boldness given to him by the Holy Ghost, drove him to plain preaching, unless you repent, you will perish. Now you know that our nation is on a path to hell, and in large part because the church has discarded the message of repentance. Sin must be exposed in order to produce repentance. People have to be made uncomfortable. They have to be confronted with their dirty laundry. Or they will never repent. Listen. It isn't... There's a lot of people that's going to hell because they have forgotten their sin. So we have to be reminded of our sins. And the gospel message points out our sin and our need of repentance. You can look at our advertisements in the church world and know that we have no intention of confronting sin. How many church signs have you seen advertising to the world we are a friendly church. That seems to be the most common advertisement of the modern church. We are a friendly church. And I can almost guarantee you that they're not going to try to make you uncomfortable with a pointed message about your sin when they advertise themselves that we are a friendly church. It seems like that the church world in our day has decided that the most important thing is to make sinners comfortable instead of convincing them of their sin. <clears throat> and furthermore, corruption within the church makes it impossible for the church to deal with corruption in the world. Hear me. It takes a holy church to deal with sin and demand that sinners repent of their sin. When the church is not holy, it don't deal with sin. It's only when the church has repented themselves. When the church is holy, then the church can demand repentance from sinners. And the reason the church does not demand repentance is because when the church is corrupt, 
It cannot cure the corruption in the world. Secondly, not only is there the necessity of repentance, there is the fruit of repentance. Repentance is proven by the evidence of a changed life. When the Pharisees came to the baptism of John the Baptist, he said to them, You generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance, worthy of repentance, signifying repentance in your life. He was demanding evidence of repentance from religious sinners. Understand me? These people were religious people. Pharisees. The most religious people in Israel. And John the Baptist is demanding fruit of repentance from religious sinners. Now... Follow me. In my text, Peter is not dealing with heathens. He is dealing with religious sinners and demanding of them that they repent. He is dealing with religious sinners. I say with all due respect, that this is our problem in America. Not the absence of religion, but the absence of repentance. This is our problem throughout the American church. It's not the absence of religion, but the absence of repentance. Many churches in our nation zealously defend sinners and promote sin as a good thing that keeps us humble, prevents us from becoming self-righteous. They almost become proponents of sin. And no one will ever repent of sin when sin is justified instead of condemned. We do not want to specialize in keeping sinners comfortable while they are dying and going to hell. We must proclaim God's word to sinners. God's word to sinners is repent or perish. This week, I had the opportunity to witness to a lady that I've known for many years. I asked her about her relationship with the Lord. She said she believed she was saved. I asked her, why do you believe that you are saved? And she said, because of the blood of Jesus. And I asked her, when did this happen to you? She couldn't tell me, only that it took place a long time ago. Well, I knew enough about her to know that she had no fruit of repentance in her life. So I urged her to repent of her sins. Listen to her reply. She said, I haven't done anything wrong. Well, I happen to know she's been married three times to three different men. And I happen to know that she does not attend church and hasn't for many years. And I told her that sin consisteth not only in the deeds done, but in the duties neglected. There are sins of omission as well as sins of commission. I asked her, do you pray every day? Well, no. Do you read your Bible? And she quickly and abruptly Change the conversation. But I want you to know that repentance will show up in your life. It will change the habits of your life. It will change your conversation. 
It will change your clothes closet. It will change the relationships in your home and in your family. It will change your faithfulness to the house of God. It will make a change in your devotional life, your commitment to Jesus. It will make a change in your business dealings and in your work habits. And in your giving to the work of the Lord, you will begin to give the tithe as the beginning point of your giving. It will make a change in your attitude toward moral purity. It will make a change in your concern for the biblical family unit. Now listen to me. I want you to hear me good this morning. This has been a burden on my heart. Repentance is not the same thing as asking forgiveness for sin. There are many people who pray for forgiveness of sin who do not repent of their sins. Repentance is not the same thing as asking forgiveness For sin. Repentance is a turning away from sin. Repentance is a forsaking of sin. And without repentance, there is no forgiveness of sin. You cannot receive forgiveness of sin that you do not intend to forsake. If you intend to continue in your sin... You cannot receive forgiveness of sin. Repentance is absolutely essential for forgiveness of sin. You cannot be forgiven of sin that you intend to continue. Finally, I want to talk to you about the privilege of sin. I've talked to you about the necessity of repentance. I'm sorry, I I misstated that. The necessity of repentance. I've talked to you about the fruit of repentance. I want to talk to you about the privilege of repentance. My, Peter's message produced a crisis in this crowd. They could walk away angered by that message. This man exposed my sin. And they could walk away angered by that message or they could receive the truth that they had heard and start on the journey to heaven. Or they could proceed on their way to hell by rejecting the message of repentance. People must repent of their sin in order to start the journey to the New Jerusalem. Not everybody in that audience that day on the day of Pentecost, appreciated the truth. But 3,000 of them did. Hallelujah. 3,000 of them believed it. 3,000 of them received it. 3,000 of them repented of their sins and gave their heart to Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, brother, we must not neglect this message for fear that somebody won't have it. Somebody's going to have it. Somebody's going to believe it. Somebody's going to turn from their sins. 3,000 souls repented, discovered joy in Jesus, got right with God on that day because there was a fearless preacher in the pulpit that had put his finger on their sin and demanded from God that they repent. When Peter expounded to the Jewish church at Jerusalem, In Acts chapter 11, how God had poured out His Spirit upon the Gentiles at Cornelius' house. The church at Jerusalem glorified God, excuse me, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now I want you to hear me. God granted them repentance unto life. How did God grant them repentance unto life? 
He sent this same preacher by the name of Peter, same man, to Cornelius' house. They heard the gospel and they believed it. And God granted repentance to the Gentiles. I want you to understand there are some people who cannot be renewed unto repentance. Hebrews 6, 6 tells us that there are some people who cannot be persuaded to repent. The Bible tells us in the Hebrews 12, 17 about a man in the Old Testament, Esau, who sold his birthright. He could not recover it, though he sought it carefully with tears. He found no place of repentance. The Bible tells us in Revelation 16 when the vile judgments are being poured out upon this world. Twice in Revelation chapter 16, under the crushing force of God's judgments in the book of Revelation. Twice the Bible says, and they repented not of their sins. What I'm trying to get you to understand is this. Repentance is a privilege from God. God is the one that wakes us up. God is the one that sends His Word, puts His finger upon the corruption in our life, persuades us to turn from our sins and believe on Jesus with all of our heart. Repentance is a privilege God granted to them. Repentance! Hallelujah. When God grants repentance through the work of the Spirit, the strong application of the truth, repentance brings rejoicing. It leads to thanksgiving. It may be a bitter peal at the moment, but it leads to rejoicing. It leads to thanksgiving. It leads to joy. It frees us from the guilt of our sin. It sets us free from the shame of our secret sins. And from the burden of trying to pretend that all is well while our life falls apart outside of Jesus Christ. We confess our sins. We confess our wretchedness to God. We agree to forsake our sins. We receive forgiveness of our sins. And I'm telling you, repentance leads to rejoicing. Hallelujah. Oh my. To be set free. To come to grips with sin. To acknowledge it. To turn from it. Hey listen. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. That godly sorrow worketh repentance. Unto salvation. Not to be repented of. Salvation, a salvation never to be regretted when we turn from our sins and receive forgiveness of our sins. That, my brother, leads to rejoicing. It's never to be repented of, never to be regretted. Repentance not only affects us, but it causes consternation in hell. And it causes rejoicing in heaven. Jesus told us that heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. More than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. One soul that submits to the word of God. That confesses their sins and turns from their sins. Causes rejoicing in heaven. Hallelujah. I read, Sister Judy, I want you to come to the piano. I read a story about a man by the name of Dr. Evans who was a student at Booty Bible Institute. This, I think, took place some years ago. And he was witnessing to a man at the Pacific Garden Mission there in Chicago. And the man told him, I don't believe in the Bible. I'm an atheist. The young man said to him, except you repent, 
ye shall all likewise perish. The man said, I told you, I don't believe that. The young man said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. The atheist said, you disgusting fellow, what's the use of you telling me that? And the young man repeated, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. It made the atheist so mad, he balled up his fist and hit him between the eyes. Knocked the young man flat. His Bible went one way and him another. He got up and said, God loves you and accept you repent. You shall all likewise perish. The man stalked away and went home. But the next night he was back. He said, all night long, all I could see on my walls was accept you repent. You shall all likewise perish. And my face and my pillow and all I could see was except you repent. You shall all likewise perish. And everywhere I looked and all my thoughts were except you repent. You shall all likewise perish. And he said, I come to settle it tonight. I'm telling you, brother, if there's a sinner in this place. There's one word for you from God. This is God's word to you. Repent. Turn from your sins. Repent or perish. He said, Preacher, I pray every day for God to forgive me my sins. You're going to go to hell asking God to forgive you of your sins if you don't turn from your sins. Asking for forgiveness of sin. Is not the same thing as repenting. You must turn from your sin. I feel the Lord here. I wonder, is there anybody here? Maybe a religious sinner here. Like those that Peter preached to On the day of Pentecost, not heathens, religious sinners who had never repented. I'm telling you, this is God's word to you, sinner. Except you repent, you are going to perish. Is there a sinner here? Right now. You'd get up and come to this altar and say, Lord, I'm ready to deal with this. I'm ready to deal with sin. I'm ready to confess and forsake my sin and get right with God. I would be a criminal if I didn't tell you the truth about your sin. Are you ready to meet God? Are you one of those, you know, just living in sin, hoping God's going to hear you every night? Forgive me, Jesus. I know I'm sinning, but forgive me. It ain't going to work. You've got to make up your mind. I'm turning away from my sin. Wait in just a moment here. That same Holy Ghost that was on the day of Pentecost is right here tonight, this morning in this service. And He's speaking. And if you're here and you haven't repented, it's time to repent. God once winked at our ignorance, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Have you truly repented of sin? You must repent or perish. Let's stand together. All are open.
altars are open. Heaven's looking on. Somebody has got their face away from God and headed toward hell can turn around this morning. And the message in heaven is they're facing this way. They're coming this way. They've turned around. They're coming this way. Is there anybody in this service right now that the Holy Ghost has pricked your conscience and you know it's time to turn around and repent of sin? Wait in just a few moments. Altars are open. God has one word. One word. Repent. This is God's word. Repent. We're waiting. Heaven's waiting. We're waiting. Altars are open. Sinner, why wait? Why put it off? Why think I'll do it later? Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Like praying, the altars are open. Anybody feels like praying.